thanks for uh, thanks for showing up and finding the finding the room in the lovely maze of uh, of rooms. I took some time this morning to try and figure out where things were. Uh, it wasn't a short process. Um, so anyway, so uh, welcome. I am going to uh, talk about uh, using OpenStack to run OpenStack. Um, if that doesn't make sense immediately, then that's fine. Uh, hopefully by the end of the talk it will. Um, if you want to connect with me in, in, a, in a virtual form, uh, you can do it at those, uh, at those locations. Uh, if you email me, I probably won't respond to it because I'll probably not see the email because uh, I get a lot of those and I don't know how to manage email. But I figure it's at least, you know, whatever. Um, so, uh, so I like to sort of, in case you don't know why you're listening to me talk about anything, uh, take a, just a real brief intro to myself. That's apparently what I do when I'm not standing up here to make faces at people. Um, uh, I work for Hewlett Packard. Uh, they pay me to work on OpenStack, which is really kind of cool. Um, uh, I also uh, run the help run the, um, the OpenStack developer infrastructure. Uh, the, I sit on the foundation board and the technical committee for OpenStack. Uh, and I have a, a team of people because apparently somebody has decided it's a good idea to give me employees. Um, <laughs> I don't know what crack they were smoking. But um, uh, I have a team of people working on the, on the project that we're going to talk about today. So basically, I'm going to take credit for other people's work uh, shamelessly. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm OK with that. Um, I, they're they're doing a great job, um, and it's all, definitely all all the result of my expert uh, engineering management skills. Um, has nothing to do with the fact that they're all really smart dudes um, and and girls. Sorry, they're not just smart dudes. Actually, it's, uh, oh wow, gosh, I'm already digging myself into a hole. Um, it's, it's just a, we're starting off great. Have I have I picked on Shuttleworth yet? I I feel like it's it's time to. Um, so OpenStack. Uh, oh gosh. Um, uh, uh, it turns out that some people may not have heard of, of OpenStack, um, and that's, that's actually um, pretty cool, because um, we get the chance to talk to you about it. Um, OpenStack is uh, uh, software, open source software uh, to help you run a cloud. Um, of course, then we get into the, the lovely conversation that can take hours at a bar uh, of what the heck does the word cloud mean. Um, for the purposes of this, uh, I think I'd like to uh, propose that it is um, uh, it is is somewhat of like a you can think of it as sort of like a multi a multi computer operating system. Um, so so rather than it being an operating system for a computer, it's more like an operating system for a for a data center's uh, worth of computers with a similar a similar set of, of abstractions. Um, so we uh, we have we have some some general resources in the cloud compute networking. Uh, and storage things, um, and there's hardware that actually provides you those resources ultimately into the day. But uh, as you're accessing those resources uh, in a cloud context, uh, you as the consumer don't really actually need to, or in many, in most cases, you you have no ability to know anything about the actual characteristics of the of the hardware itself. It's not important to you for your applications that you're gonna gonna run on top of the thing. So you see up the top, there's little your applications thing. They're, they're sort of small. We're we're gonna marginalize them. Uh, in talking about OpenStack, um, but your applications will run on top of this using APIs. Um, so uh, there's a there's we 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 continually make um, very bad metaphors and references for for what this is. Um, but in a lot of ways, I I think that this is similar to um, to the the API abstractions that come out of out of Linux or 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 in general Unixes to to abstract away the the details of the hardware that you're running on and allow you to write applications to uh, a, a set of abstract uh, APIs, um, and and in this case, uh, it, it it turns out that that if you have say you know ten thousand machines in a data center, uh, the the sets of APIs that your application needs to be able to uh, provision the computing resources uh, that it needs to operate on are a little bit different than the APIs that it needs to say do something like create a directory on disk. Um, not that different because it's sort of still the same operator. Hey, I'd like some place to store some data. Anyway, um, and now that I've spent a half an hour on a marketing slide, um, uh, so this is this is sort of in general uh, to, to give uh, to, because just to give a, a little bit more of a um, uh, of of, an, of a sort of overview of, of where this is coming from. Um, it's it's software to to help run clouds, and it wants to it wants to run sort of at all scales, public, private, whatnot. Um, we, at the moment, I put this one up, this is actually a little bit old, but as of at least six months ago, I have no idea how it's changed, but there were at least eight different public clouds running 
uh, running OpenStack. And so, yeah, I, th I, believe, I believe you're right. Um, uh, but so, so one of the things that's interesting about that is, is that you don't just have, um, uh, you, you don't just have like one one vendor who's who's giving you things. So you know, your your all of your most of your cloud vendors that are out there at the moment, they have their they've got their APIs. They're sort of trying to do their thing, and it, it's sort of again like the early operating system days where everybody was sort of trying to to get app developers to write to to their platform. Um, but in this case, we've actually got. Uh, we've got multiple multiple vendors who are who are running basically the same platform, um, which which I think is is really important because it gets you to the point where where you can actually start to develop a, a, an ecosystem that isn't dependent on the whims of a crazy executive who likes to throw chairs, because um, nobody wants to be dependent on that. Um, so again, like I like to steal slides from the marketing people because they make much more attractive slides than I do in most cases. Um, this is this slide. The base part of the slide is from six months ago. Um, six months ago, we had 148 companies uh, associated uh, with OpenStack and working on it. We now have over 200. Um, we we had uh, around 6,000 individual members of our foundation. Uh, we're actually now over 12,000. Um, uh, the the code contributors that we had, um, uh, the the cumulative number down there was was somewhere around 739. Although I believe that number was a little bit low even at that slide time. Um, uh, the latest number that I've seen is actually around uh, 1,600 over the lifetime of the project, um, which, if you think about the rate of increase, uh, is actually pretty impressive. Um, and and it, it's there's sort of a, a cute uh, <laughs> there's sort of a cute how many patches were merged in the in the previous cycle number compared to how many we've done in a given period of time now. So um, the project's growing really really fastly. Uh, if you I, I believe that Olo considers this the fastest growing open source project in the history of open source. Um, that doesn't mean that we're the biggest or the best or whatever, but we certainly grow really quickly, um, which is one measure of, of success. Um, we're, we're a collection of, uh, of projects, right? So we're not, it's not just that you can't just clone OpenStack from the Git repo. Um, I mean, you, you can clone OpenStack from Git repos, uh, but you'll be cloning many, many, many Git repositories uh, to get the job done. Um, at least until we land that super project, but um, but in general, it's it's a it's sort of a, a federation of things because it turns out there's a lot of different concerns that go into running a cloud, and we're growing more every day. Um, uh, actually, the 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 database is a service uh, uh, service trove that's down there on the, on the bottom that was sort of uh, a, a few weeks ago was incubated to to be included. will will be in. Uh, uh, will be included in the next release. Uh, we've got an, another thing that I'm going to talk about here today, Ironic, which is in the in the incubation path. Uh, we have several more that are in the incubation path that I haven't put on here, uh, and uh, and so it's a uh, it's it's continually growing. Um, uh, I'm going to sort of skip over this because I've been babbling too long anyway. But uh, we sort of pulled some things from the Ubuntu model. We do time-based releases. We have design summits, um, and for those of you who haven't. Uh, internalized all of the all of the terminology around OpenStack yet. Uh, we like to name our releases after um, uh, after a a geographical location that is related to the location where we hold our our uh, biannual uh, semi annual uh, design summits. Um, we just released Havana, which might make you think that we had the last summit in Cuba. Um, but it turns out there is a town called Havana in the state of Oregon. Um, <laughs> And and that's the one we chose. Um, before that, uh, the the previous release was called Grizzly, which is not a town in the state of California. But we'd had a couple of uh, summits in California, and people were sick of of that. Uh, and and so one of our developers suggested that the flag has a grizzly bear on it, and grizzly bears are cool. So you know, there's some there's some um, there's some going back and forth. This is actually we've got now got like three in a row that sort of have weird explanations behind them. Um, our next summit is in Hong Kong uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, it turns out that words starting with I aren't a feature of the Chinese language, um, really. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we had a hard time finding a, a, a location that started with the letter I. Um, uh, but it turns out there is a street in Hong Kong called Ice House. So this is not named after the cheap, terrible American beer. Uh, it, it, is, it is actually named after a street uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, we also really uh, give them year numbers. Uh, this is turning into much more of a talk on overview of OpenStack than, than it really is supposed to be. So, um, so back to the, to the matter at hand, um, why, like, why do we want to use uh, a, a cloud? Um, and part of, part of a lot of the reason for that is 
uh, is, is for velocity. It's so that you can get your, your application done. It's so you can get your task done. The cloud itself is actually, in and of itself, not particularly important or interesting, except that we're here talking about it. Um, but, but you don't really want the cloud to be the thing that you're doing, right? You want to, you, you've got, you've got your application, you've got your, you've, you've got your, your system that you're wanting to deploy and, and cloud technology is a way to do that in a more, in a, uh, in a, in a quicker and a more nimble fashion, right? So that you can, you can, uh, you can respond to issues that you've got. Uh, so you don't have to call the IT department and be like, well, you might be the IT department, but uh, you don't have to. You don't have to call somebody and be like, hey, I need another web server. Can you can you go down and rack something up for me? And uh, and we need to order another server. And so let's go get it, and we'll cable it up, and you know we'll provision it. And that might take you know a few weeks or whatever. Um, in, in the sort of the cloud context, you can just I, it takes me maybe about five minutes um, because you you ask the cloud for one, and then it's actually got to go do one, and then then you've got a new computing resource that you can use to. Uh, to deploy your your code on, and that's um, that means that you can make a lot, you can make a you can make a whole bunch, a, a whole different set of choices, right? You can you can try something out. You can spin up a new server, stick something on it, give it a shot, and go, oh whoa, that didn't work. I mean, it's terrible. You just delete it. It's not a big deal, um, and and so it it allows you to to do that, and it allows you to do that with with your really big complicated applications. Like because again, if you've got a thousand, if you've got an application that takes a thousand nodes to deploy on, then making structural changes in that is going to be a really costly. Uh, a, a really costly proposition. It's it's gonna you're gonna you're gonna really think twice about about exploring how you might reorganize that in a in a substantial way. Um, but if you if you've got cloud, you can you can do that. You can you can spin up as we do in the OpenStack infrastructure. You can we we spin up uh, we spin up a whole new cloud about a thousand times a day to test it to see if it works, and that's and that's great. Um, so you can do all of these things. You can you can develop in cloud instances. You can test in them and you can deploy in them. Um, and and you've you've got all that available. And I mean, I don't know if, how many of you have ever worked with a, a large scale application, but you normally don't get, say, if it's a thousand node deployment, you probably usually in the traditional world don't get a thousand uh, machines in your dev test lab uh, to to do a test of 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 your deploy. Um, some reason the people up in upper management seem to think that's a waste of money. Um, they're wrong, of course, but um, you get some of that back. So that being said, um, this is. This is a, a more realistic picture of what an OpenStack deployment actually looks like. This is also a slightly old slide. It's much more complicated than this now. Um, so if, if we think about cloud as an enabler for being able to sensibly uh, talk about the deployment of complicated applications, um, what, what's a more, what, what type of application could be more complicated than a cloud itself? Right. This is this is the type of thing that you've got to deploy somewhere, um, and this is providing people all of the lovely uh, resources that they need to 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 make their applications, uh, you know, portable and cross-platform and, and and quick and easy and and, and fast. Um, but the, the the poor saps who who deploy this uh, don't get any of those benefits. They're 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 underneath all of the all of the goodness dealing with. All of those lines and all of those boxes and all of those arrows and all of the complexity of actually uh, actually dealing with that on real hardware, um, uh, and and that's I don't know it's kind of rude. It's like you know you're you're the um, I was gonna make a terrible reference. That's never mind. You're not like a guy with a palm frond at all. But um, it's uh, uh, we we'd like to help these guys out. So um, when you when you have a complicated app, either your application or in in my case the application being uh, running a cloud itself. Um, there's there's some there's some real specific uh, failure scenarios that can happen in a in an application that is that complicated. These can happen in any application, but um, but they, they are particularly hairy uh, when your when your application is data centers in size. Um, uh, specifically, uh, um, amazingly, as it, it it may be hard to believe, but even though it's open source software and even though there's 1,600 odd developers who've worked on it, there might be bugs. Uh, we we do a lot of testing. We do we do a lot of testing. Um, bugs creep in. Sorry, it happens. It's a it's a you know we're not yet perfect. We'll get there, uh, but we're not perfect. Um, so you you've got to sort of you got to deal with those um, when you've got when you've got thousands of machines. Uh, Cruft and entropy are gonna are gonna arise in them, right? Somebody's gonna shell into a machine and they're gonna install something, forgetting that they've installed it, or they're gonna they're gonna bork a file up. Uh, you know, and then over over time, uh, especially at scale, those things add up, and then you go to do an deployment, and it fails on one of the machines, and you're like, why did it? 
Why did that deploy, <laughs> deploy onto 500 machines and fail on machine 501? That sucks. Um, uh, and then also, you know, hardware fails. Turns out virtual hardware fails in clouds too. Um, but that's actually not the, not the, not, not the problem. Things, things fail, your resources fail, and you sort of have to, you have to, to deal with those. Um, so in general, our, our approach to, um, to helping to deploy uh, our, our lovely complicated uh, cloud software is to use cloud software to do that. Um, uh, and and there's, there's, there's several sort of key, key pieces to this. First of all, we want to be able to deploy our cloud uh, taking advantage of, of both continuous integration and delivery. It's a really, really complicated thing. Waiting for six month releases, even though we make them, uh, to upgrade your cloud is probably a, a disastrously stupid idea. Um, because, not because the, the software won't upgrade, but because the, the maintenance window that is involved in doing that upgrade is, is, is pretty big. And, and most of the larger cloud providers that have, that started off thinking that they were going to do that, uh, quickly realized that, um, that, that the scope of changes that they had to make to their infrastructure over the bundling up six months worth of changes uh, was it was it was just it was just too much to too much to bite off at one point in time. Whereas if they would start to to roll them out in a continuous fashion in a in a in a you know once a week or once a day or something like that, then then it was much easier to to sort of understand and deal with the the, the changes and, and the impact. Um, so we'd like to be able to do that uh, if, if we can if you can do lots of small small changes and be uh, be confident in them uh, then then you don't you know you don't start to fear the upgrade um, you sort of do it all the time uh, we want to want to want to keep this down like again I said cloud not to not to undercut the lovely businesses that people are running such as mine um, uh, of of providing cloud software for you um, it, it's it's still it's still a thing where it's you don't want to spend all of your all of your energy on maintaining this thing, right? This this thing is an enabler for for something else. So the more we can automate this, the more we can we can uh, we can streamline this. Is the less we're spending on <laughs> on the abstraction layer. Like it's it's uh, you don't you don't want to think about this. You want it to just kind of sort of work. Um, uh, and the other thing that, that's fun about about uh, we want to we want to sort of encapsulate this so that it's it's doing. Um, I I want to be able to describe um, if I describe an installation of my cloud in in cloud terms using cloud APIs, um, then then it means that I can I can I can sort of repeatedly test that in in my cloud that I've got. Uh, I can test deploying it so that I can do a dev test cycle and and I can have the APIs that are driving that dev test cycle be identical to how they are going to be when I actually go to do the, do the deployment. Um, and it also means that my, my fine folks who are actually running the, the software underneath the cloud, they, they get access to all of the nice tools that we've developed for the people who uh, deploy fancy you know, Heroku apps or, or whatever it is. Um, I don't think we're going to deploy this using Heroku yet, but you know, uh, they, get all the, they get all the fun new, the fun new toys. So, so in general, to, to the, in, once we start digging into the specific things, I mentioned CI/CD. Uh, th that's that's one of the ways to deal with. Uh, we think is a really important way to, to deal with bugs. Um, one of them, the, the CI side of that is uh, trap them before they happen. Uh, don't let them into the don't let them into the into the product or into the deployment. Um, and then on the CD cycle, if you're if you're deploying on a reasonably continuous basis and you hit a bug that missed your continuous integration cycle. Um, uh, and and you find it in production, then you you actually can roll out a fix pretty quickly. Whereas a lot of times you'll you know if your if your deployment cycle is a thing that takes you a couple of weeks to 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 manage, and then you've got an issue. Well, now what do you do? Like now how do you how do you actually respond to the uh, uh, the the production issue? And what happens a lot is is the thing that actually leads to the second thing is that if you have a if you have a long sort of a, a long onerous process filled uh, deployment thing where somebody's got to managers have to sign off on a whole bunch of paperwork and you know like you go and you have discussions and it takes three weeks or four weeks or two months to decide you're going to do another deployment because it's a really expensive operation and then you get a you get a production issue then what happens is some admin logs into the box to fix the production issue live um, and then the next time you go to do a deployment you've got a You've got a, a a a workaround in in production in place uh, that then is is probably a little bit different than your pristine state was in your that you were testing from originally, and so now you've got to you've got to sort of manage two different change cycles. And for some reason, people think that they don't need to 
that that change that the admin did to work around it is not as important. Anyway, so if you can get all that down, then you, what you do to fix the, the production issue the next time is you just do another deploy using your normal mechanism that just works that way. Uh, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty spectacular. Um, so if, if we're just going to be able to deploy over and over again, like, you know, let's do 20 deploys in a day, um, then uh, uh, there's, there's a couple of different efficiency things uh, that go into that. But our, our expectation is that we're not going to be logging in and changing things in, in production on the individual boxes. Uh, and we want these, these deploys to go pretty quickly. Uh, and so we've got, a, we've got a system that's actually based on, uh, on an image-based deployment uh, system, which is, which is actually working pretty well. Um, and then, uh, and then it, may or, it may or may not go out without saying, um, but it actually comes into the upgrade uh, scenario, is that hardware fails, man. Like, it just fails. Um, uh, and, and so basically, all of the services that you've got have to be set up in, in a high avail highly available fashion so that you can deal with the hardware failures. The nice part about that is that you can, you can take advantage of that high availability, high availability setup to do rolling deploys. And, and it's the same mechanisms that you, that you need to be able to, to do to be able to do an upgrade without downtime. Um, it's, you know, <laughs> it's sort of solving the same problem from two different uh, mindsets. But anyway, um, this is a little bit of a viewpoint uh, before we get into the, a, a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the specifics is uh, all, all of these in, in deploying changes, at some point in time, all of those changes came from a developer and their, and their laptop. Or maybe they're a developer with a desktop, but you know, I don't think we need to go into all of the branching conditions of what type of computer. Maybe they wrote the change on their phone. Uh, I don't think they probably did, but at some point in time, a developer writes a change um, and he uploads it into the, into the system. Now, in, in our world, in, in the OpenStack world, uh, we, we do a lot of testing on changes before, before we land them, uh, which, is, which is really fun. Um, but we're, we're really not going to focus on that at this point. Um, the, well, it's, it's sort of that. Uh, but you basically, there's, there's a couple sort of cycles that, that go in, which is that you want to you wanna test the change that you're doing. This involves build some images of the, of the component that you were working on and deploy them into a, into a cloud and test that they work. Uh, and that's sort of sort of first line of of defense. Did did your change actually you know do the thing you wanted it to? Um, and if it did, then then that's cool. Um, so you you sort of now you've got the you've got the the image of your um, uh, of 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 your component. Um, toss that into the into the pile and combine it with all of the all of the other existing uh, components that that exist. Because again, this is a multi a multi component setup, right? Um, so toss that in and actually just start a, a whole new cloud. Uh, deploy it. Uh, make sure that it works, make sure that you can upgrade another one, go through that, do all of that testing cycle down here. Again, sort of still using the same, the same artifact that you built uh, up in up the other ha upper hand uh, portion with all the little small letters that I can't read even here. Um, uh, and and you, you run that deploy, and, and once, you're, once that works, once you're happy that it both installs and upgrades, uh, then you can publish those images into your, uh, into your production repositories and the the, the, the decision to deploy them or not deploy them is a policy decision rather than, a, rather than a, an operational uh, decision. It should be, it should be a, a, a known quantity at that point in time. Um, so we believe in, uh, in the Triple O project, we, we believe very strongly in, in, in specific tools with specific problem domains that you can understand and reason about and that are modular, that don't, they don't require each other to work. Um, and we've sort of done a little bit of comparison here uh, in, in the worldview. Everything I'm talking about here, you can use other tools to do. Like, there's there's absolutely nothing that I'm talking about that you have to use uh, our our tools to to do. Um, and and there's there's several combinations of things that that do a that do a good job. Um, however, uh, I I think in some of the cases there's a there's uh, there's a sort of a blurring of lines of 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 some of the the concerns. Um, uh, and so specifically, we've got sort of five uh, five things that we've, uh, that we've broken this out into, um, basically starting down at the, at the very lowest level um, from the provisioning layer, you've, you've, got to, you've got to be able to get the resource on which that you want to put software. Uh, you need to put software on that resource. Uh, you, 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 meet, you may or may not need to configure that software. Um, the, 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 uh, the state of the running of that software on, on that resource uh, the, the sort of life cycle, is it running, is it not running, is a thing that you need to manage. And then at a larger level, that's all describing things that happen on a machine, um, but the orchestration of the running and of the doing those things across machines is, is, is the next, when you're, especially when we're talking about cloud things, it's, 
it's not enough to just say apt-get install Apache onto a machine. You need to sort of do that knowing that your other, the other portions of your, of your cluster are in the appropriate state. Uh, and and doing, th doing things in sequence, uh, you know, with dependency graphs across machines is sort of an important thing. Um, so various of, various of, these, of these tools do uh, have different approaches to that. Um, and you know, I'm not going to really go into to the specific there, but we have, we have basically a tool, uh, a tool for each of them. And then if you're into some of these other tools, honestly, um, we've, we've d tried our best to make each of these sort of standalone components. So it's absolutely completely conceivable that if you're a big, uh, you know, uh, Ubuntu Moss fan, uh, that you could actually still use Nova for provisioning and then and then ask Moss to get you a, a, a thing out of Nova and and go juju the, the on top of that. Absolutely conceivable. Same thing, the the our config and state management things should be able to work both with or without uh, you know, Chef and Puppet. And we've actually got some the guys at Red Hat have been doing some of that. So like you should be able to combine these things, but from the from the OpenStack perspective, um, we, we do want there to be a, a sort of full end-to-end -end story that we can do basically using OpenStack primitives and, and, and OpenStack things without, without having to say, okay, well, now you want to install OpenStack. The, okay, so go grab some Chef or some Puppet, depending on what your religious affiliation is. Or, or do you, so now we're, okay, yeah, so, so here's, the, here's the, the 12 different ways you could install OpenStack depending on your preconceived notions of how you want the world to work. That's great. I want all of those to work, but also want to, to make sure that, that I can just tell you how to install OpenStack and not have to worry about, and if you've got a chef thing, then awesome, go do that. Um, but, but we get really quickly into, into the quicksand of, you know, VI versus Emacs, and that doesn't really help anybody. Um, so the components really specifically, uh, we, we have several of them, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about each of them uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, the, it all sort of build, builds on the basis of using Nova to actually drive, Nova's the compute portion of OpenStack, uh, using that to drive your actual bare metal deployments. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a piece that actually just is part of OpenStack for the first time as of last week um, uh, in the Havana release called Heat, which is the orchestration piece, which knows about how all these things line together. We have a tool for building disk images, because if we're going to be deploying and upgrading using disk images, we might need a tool to create them, um, amazing as that might be. There's sort of a trio of, of commands that I think are, are a lot of fun. Um, uh, OS something config, uh, apply, refresh, and collect. Uh, collect config is, is actually particularly uh, fun. I can't remember if I've got a slide specifically about it, um, but it's a, it's a tool that knows how to get all of the metadata um, in, on a given cloud instance to get the metadata from all of the different metadata sources that might exist uh, for that, whether it's the heat metadata service or the, uh, the uh, you know, cloud init metadata that's, that's there on first boot, all of those various different things and combine it and give it to you as here's the metadata about yourself that you know so that all of your tools don't have to do that multiplexing. Um, and that's, that's all it does. You can run it outside of the context of all this, spin up an Amazon node and type OS collect, uh, OS collect config and it'll spit out some JSON. Um, so, so we've sort of trying to make these, these like that. Uh, and then additionally, we have the collection of, of image elements that describe the disk images that we want to build to be able to deploy an OpenStack, uh, as well as a set of, of heat templates that, that describe the relationship uh, of those things. Um, so the, the, basic, uh, the basic sort of story of, um, of the deployment is that you have a heat stack that defines, uh, defines the, the cluster, and then heat tells the Nova API, hey man, uh, I want you to boot these images on, on these machines because sort of heat understands the structure of that. Um, uh, and, and that's like those, those sort of two things, that's, that's, the, that's the whole picture. All the rest of them, all the rest of the things that we've got going on here are, are tools, to, um, uh, tools to enable the, those two things to happen. Um, the, uh, you can do all of this in virtual machines uh, for your development test because these are all cloud images, right? So like they boot just as well on bare metal as they do on virtual machines. So there's, there's really no difference. It's, it's all cloud semantics. Uh, and then you can, you can use the bare metal both. You, if you've got enough bare metal to do bare metal in your CI CD environment, that's great. Uh, uh, and then obviously for your production deploy. Um, so in case any of you might have a background in MySQL at all, uh, you know that one of the, you may or may not know that, that MySQL has this, this thing called pluggable storage engines. Um, uh, which was actually actually pretty pretty spectacularly both singular and, and interesting. Um, it since since I started playing with since I started doing anything with MySQL, MySQL's default storage engine has changed 
twice. So there have been three different default storage engines, the original ISAM, and then the MyISAM, and then now InnoDB is the thing. Um, but from a person consuming, uh, from a person consuming a MySQL uh, database, you, you don't, unless you want to get into advanced things and like, you'd, like you need to DBA something or something like that, you actually don't have to know very much uh, about that. Um, OpenStack Nova has much the same, uh, much the same approach. It has a, it has multiple hypervisor support behind behind it, so it's you can run it with Zen or KVM or Hyper-V or VMware. Um, and from a from an API perspective, for the most part, hand wavy, hand wavy. There's some differences, but for the most part, it's it's the same. So um, so uh, I gosh, almost about a year ago, uh, the a little over a year ago actually, the guys at uh, NTD Docomo. Um, uh, started work on code to write a, a bare metal virtual driver, vert layer driver for Nova. Um, and then uh, we got involved and, and started, uh, started working with them. Eventually got that landed into, into the mainline Nova core. So that was actually, that's been in, been in released Nova since Grizzly. Um, and it's, it basically goes into the compute layer as, as a driver. And rather than talking to a hypervisor, uh, it makes IPMI and Pixie calls uh, to your to your hardware. So when you say Nova boot blah, it's actually just sending power management signals out, and it's actually turning on a machine and causing it to reboot and Pixie boot the the image that you want, um, uh, but sort of hiding all the mechanics of that, um, uh, and then it deploys the the machine image. That th this this is sort of the the underlying piece that makes all of the rest of the conversation about this happen because now we've got the ability to at least on a machine by machine basis. Um, use Nova rather than Pixie calls ourselves to to be able to to touch the machines. Um, so we've got at least the same uh, user facing API to to deal with those. Um, Heat sort of the next layer in in the stack. Uh, like I said, it, it focuses on orchestration. It's the open stack orchestration piece. Um, it's it its worldview is is basically the it, it knows about your about your cloud and your and your your set of machines. It, it's not really it doesn't really care about what's going on inside of the machine. It's its focus is on the relationship of the different nodes in your system to each other, and and the con, sort of connective tissue that they that they might need to know. Like sometimes your you know your WordPress server might need to know the database login credentials that were from your database server, but in general, it doesn't really need to know whether you know your 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 MySQL server certainly doesn't need to know whether Apache or Nginx is running on your on your WordPress server. They're not. It Heat doesn't care about those details. It cares about basically just the pieces of metadata uh, that might need to be communicated between nodes. Um, so you can you can use underneath Heat any config management system on your nodes that you that you want to. It's not really Heat doesn't care. Heat's going to be driving, like basically sending an event to the to the system and saying, "Hey, man, do your next thing uh, that you want to do." Um, and it does that by dropping some, some JSON into the into the machine, which it turns out Puppet and Chef and Salt and, and all of those guys can pick up JSON and use it as an input uh, for config parameters for uh, for your configuration management. So it config it'll deliver the metadata, and then also once it's requested the machine do something, the machine can also report metadata back to, to Heat and say, okay, well you asked me to you asked me to do my thing, and now I've done my thing, and I'm going to tell you this piece of information about myself that that you as Heat probably don't care about, but you're just going to store it as information that you need to know about me, and you'll tell other people when they request that that data. Um, and uh, so it, it it winds up being sort of a nice uh, modular piece. Uh, like I said before, we've got a set of of templates describing an OpenStack deployment, which is in the the Triple O Heat templates repository. All the, if I mention a repository, it's all in. Uh, OpenStack's Git repositories and the OpenStack uh, grouping. Um, uh, so, so once we've got Heat orchestrating and telling things uh, what to what to do, um, the we, we have to sort of get the we have to boot something. We have to get software on there. And this is this is where I was mentioning we we're, we've become a really big fan of of using golden images for this. Um, I, I think that. These have gone through various stages of being liked and hated in the in the industry for various reasons. Um, they they seem to fit the the cloud semantic model uh, particularly well, partially because we have base we're always booting machines off of base images in in sort of the uh, when you're talking about things from cloud semantics, you're like, hey, boot me a an Ubuntu or a or a, or a Fedora, and you're you're starting from an image. You're not starting from an installer. You're like Nova boot Ubuntu does not get a bare Virtual machine and run the Ubuntu OS installer from from a DVD image into that. That would take 
well, it'd take about an hour. Um, it would be terrible. Um, so we pre-do that. And so, so this is, this is a, a, a sort of metaphor we're trying to, to carry through. Um, there's, if that's how we're going to boot a, a normal machine, then you know, why don't we do that for, uh, for our actual uh, service machines? And you see this in the, in, you know, the AMIs in the, in the Amazon world are a common way for companies to you know, say, hey, here's our appliance. Go boot it, and there it is. It's, it's a pre, it's not, they don't give you a, a pile of chef recipes to run on a bear machine. They give you a, the set of the software. Um, you've got to be able to deal with, with upgrades, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a second, but um, one of the ways to conceptually think about this, uh, and again, this gets into sort of cloud, cloud semantics anyway. So I, I boot a, say I boot a, a normal cloud VM, uh, and I'm going to run my, my stuff on it. Uh, you, you, you basically get a, an, an ephemeral disk locally with the, uh, with the machine that, that you, is sort of expected to, if that VM dies, that's just going to go away. Like, it's just, it's gone. Um, uh, and so then you're, you're expected in theory, practice is a little bit different, but the theory goes is that you're expected to, to, to attach a, a persistent block storage device to your, to your cloud image and you put important things there. You know, that's, that's where you put the stuff that you don't want to go away unless you happen to use a cloud provider where the ephemeral disks are more reliable than the block storage. But um, <laughs> I'd consider that a bug, but the design is such that, that you, that you, that you're, 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 Compute instance has some local disk in it, but you're supposed to sort of like that's for low. It's 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 local state. Like it, it could be recreated or whatever. But like database, your you know your actual files that you care about, you stick those in a in a consistent place. So same thing. If we if we split our our installation uh, in in into that same sort of striation, uh, that I'm I've got something that I can blow away and recreate as many times as I want to, and then I've got a place that I know that I don't want to touch because it's, it's really precious, then, then going in with, a, with an image and redeploying a, a new copy of the image on top of the, of the running system means you've got a section of, of, the, of the system that you know you can, you can blow away with impunity, right? It doesn't, you don't have to, you don't have to be careful about it. You're just done. Uh, and and so, um, so it makes sort of an, an image upgrade uh, process uh, a, a bit easier. The other thing that's nice about images is that you can build the image and you can deploy it into your test cloud. And then if, if that works, you can actually just deploy that image that you actually tested. Not, not you tested that you can probably recreate the state of that image, but you can actually create the state of that image, test it, and then actually take those actual bytes themselves and actually deploy those. Um, and that I think is actually pretty cool because then you can actually test the mechanisms of can I deploy, given any image, can I, can I deploy that? And you can get to confidence about that process. Uh, and then you can test the, the bytes themselves and, and you, don't have to, you don't have to sort of mix these, these two things. So, so in a lot of ways, I think if we go with the metaphor that a cloud is sort of like an operating system for the data center, then, then, then these, these disk images sort of become like, like distro packages except at the, at the machine level, right? I'm not, I'm not thinking about, I want a package, I want a deb of Nova. I'm talking about, I want, I want, to, I want a Nova controller machine. And in my, in my data center, you know, OS, uh, then I, I, I will just install the various packages and update the packages so we have a, a sort of general machinery for that rather than trying to think about packages at the data center level because it's, I think it's, it's too many. Anyway, I'm babbling about that too much. Anyway, we have a couple of tools. There's a, there's a really simple tool that has a very, very inventive name. We call it Disk Image Builder. Uh, it is the tool that we use to build disk images. Um, uh, as opposed to the rest of OpenStack, we apparently seem to, in the triple O world, come up with just nothing but terrible, terrible names for things. In term, if you like fancy names like Octothorpe or you know whatever, um, uh, and then we've got a set of image elements to, to do that. Um, so the 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 OS star config, the, the sort of triumvirate of, uh, of of config tools we've got. Like I said, these are these do wind up being like a config management system, but they're they're not attempting to be another chef or puppet. They're in fact very explicitly trying to not be another chef forever. We don't want to get into the competition with that. It's actually a really hard general case uh, problem. And, and actually both Chef Puppet and Salt and, and these guys have done a pretty good job um, for, for what they are. Um, but, but we need a way to basically to, to in between heat and disk images, uh, we, we, we sort of need to be able to handle some config files basically in a, in a sane manner um, if we're doing all this with cloud type stuff. So, um, so the, the way this sort of hang, hangs together is, uh, like I said earlier, you've got this tool OS collect config, which will, which will collect uh, metadata from all of the metadata sources that, that exist. So if you have heat either deploying a new service or updating a new service, then two things are gonna happen. As part of the deployment, you're gonna, you're gonna have metadata come in 
from the from the from the cloud deployment process that'll be available to the node, uh, and then also Heat will ha has runs a metadata service that that is actually updatable. The the first boot is is all non updatable. Um, so so if you want to get at that, you use OS Collect config to get that, um, and then. OS refresh config sits in the place where when Heat wants to do something with a particular node, it basically sends a signal and says, hey, OS refresh config, there's, uh, there's new information for you. You might want to do some stuff, right? Um, you, you might want to, uh, I, I would like for you to, to sort of refresh your view of, of your world of, of configuration. Um, and so then what OS refresh config does in a, in a nutshell is um, it'll, it'll go through, it'll, it'll quiesce any of, the, any of the services that you have on the box that might need to not be running while you're updating. If you have something that's, that sort of can't deal with things upgrading out, out from underneath it, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll quiesce those down. It will, if you've requested new software, it will uh, grab the software from, from glance from the image service uh, and, and upgrade it. Um, it will then tell, it will then ask OS apply config the third piece of the of the the uh, the puzzle to uh, using the metadata that came in from OS Collect Config uh, to to splat that out into any config files that are that are needed to be splatted out. Um, if this uh, operation requires a reboot, it will it will trigger that. Um, a lot of it turns out a lot of upgrades don't need reboots. Uh, we've gotten to the point in life where that's possible, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it will also make sure that if it if it quiesced anything or if there's new new service state that needs to be done, it'll it'll handle that. Uh, and then it turns out after doing a lot of those things, you might need to do a, a migration. Like there might need to be a database migration that's performed, uh, you know, or a file format, uh, you know, thing that needs to be updated. Uh, or if it's an initial install, you might need to stick some initial data in there. Um, uh, so it'll it'll do that, and then it will report back to Heat. Um, that was sort of driving all this, hey, I'm done. Uh, and also, here's, here's the piece of data that you might need to know about me. Um, uh, and, then, and then at that point, if he's doing a rolling operation, then it knows that it's safe to go on to the next thing in the dependency graph, um, which, is, which is, is pretty cool. So anyway, each of these things should be uh, reasonably easy to um, reason about. So it's not really important that you can splat out entire racks of hardware in a short amount of time. Um, but one of the, one of the neat things uh, about this is that uh, several of these pieces wind up being pretty efficient. Not because we're trying to go for speed, but because um, inefficiencies wind up multiplying over over thousands and thousands and thousands of machines. Um, and so, uh, because we're not running OS installers uh, and, and we're doing all this, we we can actually go from a a, a powered a completely powered off machine to everything installed and up and running in about six minutes. Um, uh, which is uh, nice. Now, that's n hopefully that's not a that's not a time frame that's important uh, to you on an, on, an, on a regular basis. Um, but that's that's about the thing. And actually, most of those six minutes is spent in the post uh, because these are nice enterprise machines, and we haven't been able to convince hardware companies such as the one that I work for uh, that maybe not taking three minutes to boot is a good idea. Um, so, <laughs> uh, it turns out if the taking taking say four hundred you know, 400 meg or whatever, or however, even, even a few gig, and splatting that over a 10 gig network, uh, straight on DDing it onto a uh, on, onto a disk does not take very long. Uh, running lots of code, like running running apt-get install a thousand packages, that in fact does take a not insignificant amount of time because it's got to run all of the code for each of those packages. Um, so this winds up being being pretty efficient uh, to deal with. Um, so if, if, we, if we use all these to, to build a cloud, we quickly run into a situation where language fails us um, because we're talking about the, we're starting talking about multiple novas and we've got, you know, the bare metal one and the VM one and the, the whatever and, and we run out. So we've, we've, we've sort of been using the words under cloud and over cloud. Um, and, and so how it sort of winds up being modeled is that the, the bare metal cloud that you've deployed, we refer to as, as the under cloud. Uh, it's the one that's sort of sitting under the anyway, whatever. Um, so it's it's a it's a it's a bare metal cloud that's using the the, the Nova bare metal driver um, uh, to 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 operate on on that. And then clouds them cloud I don't know clouds OpenStack clouds are are by nature this built-in piece of the system 
uh, multi-tenant, right? They're, they're designed to be able to have multiple user accounts and multiple tenants that run multiple applications because, my gosh, if they weren't, they wouldn't be very useful from a public cloud perspective. Um, so, uh, so one of the ways that, so then what happens is you, you make a tenant on your undercloud and you install your, your KVM-based cloud as basically as the, as the application that's running in that tenant. Um, but because it's multi-tenant, then you can actually do multiple of these. So you've got, say, a data center of, of, of gear. Thank you. Uh, you've got a data center of gear. You, uh, you make a tenant for your production cloud. You can also just make a tenant uh, it's just another user account in your cloud for your for your dev test or your pre prod cloud, uh, and now there, there's actually there's actually no like there's literally no difference between between those other than just the the uh, the multi tenant environment of the of the cloud itself. So it's not like it's not different pools. It's not a different rack of stuff on different switches. It's the same switches. It's the same you know, it, it's the same racks of hardware. It's some of the nodes out of, out of the cloud are your dev test and some of the nodes are your production cloud. Um, and, and then as we get into sort of more advanced things, because this is a 45 minute talk, so there's, you can't go all the way down the rabbit hole, but there's, there's, or I probably could if I didn't babble as much. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, the things that you wind up looking at are when, when you're actually going to deploy one of these is you want to put in basically you know, location semantics, but you don't want to nest, you don't actually care, I want to install this Nova Compute node on this rack. You want to say, I want to install this set of Nova Compute nodes, and I sort of want to make sure there's one per rack, or I'd like for all of these nodes to be in the same rack, right? Like those are, those are the parts that you actually care about. Those are the logical constraints that you have on, on, app, on, on node placement, right? And so if you actually express those, then mixing your, mixing your dev test and your, and your prod and everything like that in, in the same pool of gear uh, actually becomes completely, completely uh, sensible. You can just say, please don't co-locate me with, you know, I'm, I'm a big beefy thing that's gonna take a lot, of, a lot of bandwidth. Really only stick one of these cloud on a given, on a rack at the same time, and then it can worry about making sure that you're not you know, putting the, the beefy dev, anyway, that's, that's the stuff. But you can, you can sort of reason about all of that in a, in a thing, and that way when you're, when you're doing your, your dev test deploys, you're, you're, you're really confident that they're going to work in the production one because it's just a different user account. Um, there's no reason that it should be any, any different between one and the other. Um, so uh, the undercloud itself is, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna have to spin through this really quickly because I'm at five minutes, um, but the undercloud itself is a fully HA uh, bare metal uh, an OpenStack bare metal installation. It it really actually only for 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 quite a while. You really only need like two machines ish. Like it, it's not it it it's not taking that much activity, <laughs> um, because once you boot a machine, this isn't doing squat. Um, so so other than rebooting and reinstalling your bare metal your your under cloud stuff, it's it's not doing that much work. So you don't really need to scale this out with with tons and tons of machines. Um, you need two so that it can be HA so that it can upgrade itself. Um, um, uh, because it, it turns out that it's it's a cloud that knows how to operate uh, and control bare metal, and it itself is installed on bare metal, so it turns out that it itself can upgrade itself by doing a rolling deploy of itself onto itself, um, which is which is the clearly the first step in Skynet. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's just, I mean we at least recognize that that's what we're doing. Um, but uh, uh, you know whatever we know Skynet's coming. Um, and you can you can uh, and that way all the rest of your bare metal machines become become resource pool for for this one to do bare metal deploys on. Uh, Overcloud again fully HA. It's got to be uh, it's hosted in the undercloud, um, uh, and and we run heat in the undercloud to deploy this one. There also will be a heat in the overcloud, but that'll be for end user applications. Um, and and for the most part, the, the the mechanics are that you can use the exact same disk images. They're just QCow disk images. Um, you can you can use the same images for most of your things uh, if you're doing a a, you know, two full machine cloud deployments for your undercloud. You probably won't actually use the same images for your overcloud because you're probably not going to be running cloud in a box a uh, hundred thousand times. You're probably going to have some more specialization there. But there's actually nothing preventing you from from doing that. There's nothing different between the between the two. Um, uh, in installation is is an interesting special case. Um, uh, and, and it goes a little bit something like this. Hey man, I've got my, my single machine image of, I said hey man a lot in this talk, I don't know what that's about. Um, I've got my single machine uh, image of, of cloud, sort of cloud in a box, and I run it on my, on my laptop, and I take my laptop and I plug it into the, into the rack. Uh, and, I, and I say, okay, so here's a couple of bare metal nodes that we know about in the rack. Um, 
uh, and it turns out that you're only one and you're supposed to be an, you know that you're supposed to be an HA pair, so clearly the other side of your HA pair has gone away. So why don't you, why don't you, why don't you fix your HA pair? So deploy, a, deploy one of the bare metal nodes in the rack, um, and now, you, now, you've, now you've solved your HA pair. Now you're, now you're an HA pair. Now you unplug the laptop. Um, and and the and the, the machine that is the the other half of the of the fixed HA pair in your rack uh, is now sitting there running. And you say, oh hey, you seem you're supposed to be an HA pair. Uh, you should fix yourself uh, and deploy a, deploy a, a second part of the pair. So you fix the pair, uh, and so then it does that. Uh, and so now you've got a an HA undercloud installed on on your rack of hardware. Uh, basically, just using nothing but the high availability, high availability semantics that you would need to have for uh, an HA undercloud anyway. Um, so at that point, you can say, "Great, I've got an. I now have an HA uh, highly available bare metal undercloud. Uh, I'm going to deploy a cloud." Um, and uh, and so that's the uh, and and then it sort of does that. So you you know, basically scale out or scale off of your off of your laptop onto a thing, and then just you probably don't want to throw your laptop away, but uh, <laughs> I mean you might, depending on what the NSA has done to it. But um, that really has nothing to do with deploying a cloud. Um, uh, and uh, one minute, gosh, I'm almost, I've, I've almost got through the things. Um, so the, the upgrade is, is sort of, uh, is one of the questions, and I, I did a bad uh, job. So there, there's, two, there's two versions of how you upgrade this thing uh, using heat. The, the simple one is if all your stuff is HA, um, then all of your stuff should be able to deal with node failures, right? So you just do the, you do the simple rolling deploy, which is shoot one of the nodes in the head, reinstall it with a new version of the thing you want from scratch, uh, and go on to the next one. Um, that should be a process that you can do for all of your nodes, um, even ones that require data migrations before you shoot it in the head, because otherwise your cloud isn't highly available and you're going to die at, in the case of, of hardware failure. It's not efficient. Uh, it's not the efficient way to do things. Um, and you probably aren't going to choose to do that 10 times in a day. Um, uh, so so the, other, the other way that you can do it, and I, I've, I've hinted at some of the elements of this uh, a, a little bit, is it turns out some of the nodes have precious data. So if we've, if we've split it into, into sort of ephemeral and, and, and precious, um, then, uh, uh, then, then we, can, we can then pull in the, the new image that we want to deploy. Uh, we can you know, do the things we need to do that I mentioned from OS Profession config in terms of questing services. Uh, and then we can, actually, we can actually just unpack the image into a local directory and rsync over the root file system. Um, which, which makes me cringe uh, a little bit because uh, rsyncing over my root file system seems like a, a thing that I most of the time don't want to do, um, which is the reason that we sort of need to, to make sure that we've got a well-known location, which is where we put data that we care about, and all we're rsyncing over is the contents of like, you know, you know, the, the results of installing some RPMs or some, or some Debian packages in, into that file system. Um, but the thing that's nice about it is that it turns out that just rsyncing some bytes is a, is a really well-known thing, and it's pretty good at its job. Uh, it, it, you, you know what it's doing, and if you do that with a dash dash delete, then you take care of the cruft problem too, right? Because you don't, if somebody left an additional file that your, your config management didn't think to put in a stanza that you need to delete that file, even though nothing is installing it anymore, but it's left over from, from the old install, um, no, that's fine. You just don't have to worry about it. It's, it's gonna, the images are going to go completely away. Um, so that's the more complicated version. You can do some more you know, orchestration in there, and we can talk about that for a long time. But I babbled too long, uh, so I can't do that. Uh, in the future, we need to do some, some better work in, in uh, Cinder to support. Uh, Cinder really works really well if you're going to attach a network or a, or, a, or a SAN or something like that, an, an external a thing as your as your uh, persistent data store because that's what it's sort of designed to do. It's the it's the block storage uh, service for OpenStack, um, but but probably in a, in an actual bare metal cloud, you actually have some local RAID disks that are the ones you actually probably want to use for your persistent data, um, and so we, we need to be able to tell to tell Cinder to to use and co-locate those as a as a source of. Uh, of of your or of your persistent d data store, it'll be much more efficient. Um, same thing, Neutron. At the moment, we're assuming that somebody has configured your switches uh, before we've come in, and we'd like to get to the point where that can do the bare metal steps of doing what it needs to do with your switches to do all of that type of stuff. Um, even you got, I mean, unless you've got a, a full open flow world, which is just fantastic. Uh, and there's some things we need to do on Ironic, uh, which is the, the replacement for Nova Bare Metal to, um, to deal with how we're booting kernels uh, and, and doing kernel upgrades without having to, uh, and I go into that. But I've babbled too long. So um, that is that. I, if there are any questions, uh, I think we're at time, so probably pounce on me uh, and find me, and I'll talk to you with beer or whatever. Uh, I'm always happy to talk over beer or to drink beer or to wear beer. I don't know. Uh, whatever, whatever it is we do with beer. So uh, anyway, thanks a lot.